even though <coughs> John sees himself, I think as he seems to be leaning towards an old gun, I kind of still see myself as a young gun, but I think every year I become more wise, just as you know, John said, it is with, as we go through our careers, we definitely learn things, we become, while I think our, our knowledge base increases, I think our knowledge about our patients and our knowledge about the struggles they go through on a personal and social level is really, I think, what matures John over, over his years, and as I will continue to learn uh, too, but I definitely have learned many components of that through the years. So just to kind of review quickly, I think the three things, uh, and John focused, uh, mentioned a lot of the original time that patients meet me is at the time they have a chest x-ray or CT scan done, oftentimes incidentally. So for example, a patient gets in a car accident and they get a chest x-ray because they thought they might have broken a rib and oops, there's a nodule or a mass in their lung. And they're a former smoker, and so they see their primary care doctor get a CT scan, and then they come to see me to figure out what this nodule is. The other <clears throat> common scenario is that the patient has a cough, the cough doesn't get any better, they give antibiotics, still don't get any better, finally get a chest x-ray and a CT scan, and there's a concern that there could be a mass or a nodule in the lung. And it's my job initially to talk the patients through what the possibilities may be, and if a diagnosis needs to be done, maybe sometimes you can just watch these things. Um, or do we need to go ahead and push forward with a biopsy because there is a concern for possible lung cancer? Then the second role is because the main risk factor for lung cancer is smoking, there's a lot of other lung diseases associated with smoking, emphysema, COPD. And so um, pul as a pulmonologist, I help manage patients with those types of uh, conditions if they have them so that we can optimize their lung function as they're going through whatever treatments they may go through, be it preoperative, to prepare them for surgery or uh, just optimize their breathing as they head into radiation or chemo. And then lastly, um, lots of, not lots, some of the therapies that are utilized for lung cancer can result in pulmonary complications. The lung, you know, sees the entire blood volume all the time. And so chemotherapy agents can affect the lungs. Radiation can sometimes injure the lungs. And so those complications are often sent to me to help kind of deal with how we're gonna manage those problems that have come as a result of treating the cancer. So let's talk first about diagnosing and staging. So actually, I'll just skip over this. The kind of group that we're in all here is kind of the locally advanced group. And so what kind of defines that is that if you look at the chest, you know, this being the lungs, is that there's a nodule or a mass somewhere in the lungs, but it's not just located in the lungs. It has spread somewhere locally in the chest, and most commonly, that's to the lymph nodes lymph nodes either out in the lung or the lymph nodes in the central portion of the chest. If it spreads outside of that area, then um, it's into the bones and the other areas of the body, and that's um, a different um, stage, as John talked about. So when patients come with these types of abnormalities, lung mass, lymph nodes, then that are enlarged and of concern or positive on a PET scan, that's when we say we're very concerned. We need to put, go ahead and push forward with a biopsy of some kind. So most commonly, the way uh, we make a, a biopsy, uh, obtain a biopsy at this time is by doing bronchoscopy. So some, some of you in the room may have had a bronchoscopy done. So basically, you make a patient groggy, make them sleepy, you take a scope that has a light and a camera on the end of it, and you know, your lungs are connected to the outside world. So we take advantage of that by going through the mouth and down into the windpipes. And the windpipes are just like plumbing. So they're tubes that basically just conduct air into the chest and out of the chest. And so I use that plumbing to kind of advance the scope down in there and try to find the abnormalities. It's actually pretty rare that we can directly see the abnormality with our scope. So we have other instruments um, that allow us to find these abnormalities to get biopsies. And one of those tools that we have now is what's called an endobronchial ultrasound scope. So this is relatively new technology. I mean, at this point, it's probably been five or six years. But what's unique about this scope is that besides just having a light and a camera on it, it now has an ultrasound machine built on the end of it. And so if you think about it, the way a bronchoscopy is done, if, if it's just tubing or plumbing, if you could imagine um, a garden hose, for example, and you put a light and a camera inside a garden hose, you can't see anything outside that garden hose, right? You can only see inside. Well, your windpipes are kind of the same thing. When I have the scope inside, I can't see outside of the windpipes. And that's where these lymph nodes live. And so before we had this technology, we would kind of use the CT scan and use our best educated, I, I, I now no longer say guess, I say assessment, because it makes me sound smarter. So we use our best educated assessment, and we would pick the area where the lymph node uh, was located, and we put a needle in it. But 
you know, we honestly, in many respects, were guessing where that lymph node was, that we had no direct evidence that we were finding it. Well, this technology really is fascinating because it's very similar to, like if you think of a woman when she's pregnant, when you look at her belly, you can't see the baby, but if you put an ultrasound on there, right, you can see everything, the arms, the legs, the face, the lips. Well, with this scope, when we put it into the windpipe and we put it against the windpipe, it's exactly the same scenario. I can see the lymph nodes, I can see the blood vessels, I can see the heart, I can see the lung, I can see everything. And then real time, while the ultrasound machine is running, there's a needle that comes out that allows me to get a biopsy of the lymph node or the mass or the nodule, whatever it is that we're interested in. And this has really advanced our ability in a minimally invasive fashion to get a diagnosis for patients and establish what's going on with the abnormalities on their scan. There are actually other even smaller ultrasound probes that we have now that are about the size of um, about 1.5 millimeters. So, you know, they're teeny tiny that we can thread all the way out to the edge of the lung that can help guide us to find these small nodules to get some biopsies, which a lot of these technologies are going to be very important. As you saw Drew talk this morning, these small nodules, somehow we're going to have to find out what these nodules are in these screening studies. And so a lot of this technology we're going to be applying as we go forward to find these small nodules. So how about optimizing lung function? So as I mentioned, patients uh, oftentimes who have lung cancer, about 85% of lung cancers are in smokers, and so those patients are at risk for also having emphysema or other lung diseases. And so my job is to help optimize their lung function at any point along their treatment, whether they're going to treat it or not. And so we can do that with various things, oxygen if they need oxygen, inhalers to help improve their function. And importantly, what tends to happen in patients with emphysema, right, is they, they get shorter breath. So no one likes to feel short of breath, so they don't do much activity. And <clears throat> while day to day, that doesn't make much of a difference, week by week, right, the less and less you do, and month by month, you just get weaker and weaker and more and more deconditioned. And so a pulmonary rehab program is really just an exercise program, but it's in the setting of a controlled environment with a respiratory therapist in a graded fashion, because most people with emphysema, that's what they're afraid of. Like, can I exercise? Should I exercise? What's my limit? Well, a pulmonary rehab program is a fashion to do that in a controlled setting to improve their function, improve their mobility. Some patients uh, with lung cancer also have asthma, so we use, I would treat them uh, with general therapies that we use for asthma, which is generally inhalers. And then lastly, some patients with uh, lung cancer can also have other lung diseases like pulmonary fibrosis, which is a scarring in the lungs that happens from a variety of conditions, and we have therapies for that. And pulmonary hypertension, which is most people think of hypertension, which is high blood pressure, if they take your blood pressure in your arm. But pulmonary hypertension is the other side of the heart. So there's two sides of the heart, the left and the right. The left side of the heart pumps blood out to the body. And so when you take your blood pressure at the doctor's office, that's regular hypertension. But the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs. And you can develop specifically high blood pressure in the right side of the heart. And that's called pulmonary hypertension. And there's also uh, therapies that we can have to treat that should patients develop it. And then lastly, uh, cancer-related complications. I'll just review um, some of the ones that can happen. So at certain periods of time, either from the therapies that a patient offered, chemotherapy, radiation, or the cancer in and of itself, fluid can develop around the lung. And that fluid developing around the lung can result in patients feeling short of breath, having limitations in their activity. And so there are procedures that we can do that can be simple, just draining out the fluid, um, or sometimes putting in a catheter that will allow the patient to access it and drain the fluid as they need. Or even Dr. Karchik has some procedures where they can drain the fluid, put a medication in there to try to get the uh, space to seal so that that fluid can't come back. And so we're involved in helping manage any of those complications should they occur. Sometimes a cancer can progress and block an airway. If airway gets blocked, that portion of the lung can no longer function. And so part of my training as an interventional pulmonologist is how do we open those airways up? We have special tools lasers, instruments, and even stents. We hear people get stents in their heart all the time for blockages. Well, we have stents that can go in the airways that can keep the airways open to improve their breathing and reduce the risk that they get an infection. Pneumonia can happen at any point in anyone, whether they're healthy or not healthy. Because patients getting treatment for uh, lung cancer, can their immune system is usually somewhat suppressed, they are at higher risk for pneumonia. So in addition to my colleagues who uh, see patients regularly that are getting treatment, um, I usually help assist in the management of their pneumonias. Radiation can sometimes cause uh, an injury, and so in, in conjunction with Ramesh and his colleagues, 
We, we help come up with a plan, which is often some medication to help reduce that inflammation in the lungs and improve the patient's symptom from a radiation injury. If it's significant enough, then patients will get either oxygen and or a pulmonary rehab program can actually be beneficial for some patients with a radiation injury. And then lastly, uh, chemo some chemotherapy agents can cause a lung injury, and so um, we help work with the medical oncologist, Dr. Langer and his colleagues, to decide is that the problem or is there something else. Oftentimes it does take a bronchoscopy to try to rule out infection or some other problem before you say it's a chemotherapy, right? Because if we say it's a chemotherapy, we can't get you that, give you that chemotherapy anymore. So we need to make sure that we're making that decision wisely before stopping the chemotherapy. And so I help in conjunction with them to make that decision. So lastly, I think you probably remember, I don't know, it's probably more than a decade or now, um, Hillary Clinton wrote a book saying that it takes a village to raise a child, right? So while certainly the parents are by far the greatest component of raising a child, the social community around them, be it cultural, religious, whatever, is also um, very important in raising a child to the appropriate um, functioning member of society, I guess. So I would argue that it takes a village to care for a lung cancer patient where at the heart of that village is the patient, right, and their family. They're the ones that are most important to us. They're the ones that we're really trying to help. And then the rest of the village, that's us. We're the ones that are supporting you through this, giving you the appropriate treatments, getting you through all the things that you need to to optimize a patient's outcomes and their quality of life. So with that, I'll stop and... Do we have any specific questions for... Uh, he's reading a lot of children's books. Uh, <laughs> he is a recent new father. Yeah. Um, spends has lots of nights up uh, taking care of the baby. So congratulations, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, I've recently been getting out of breath uh -huh. for some of them in the past. Uh, and I'm curious to know, how do you determine what the cause of that is, if it's fluid around the lungs or something else, yeah. or just, la just loss of more lung tissue because the cancer cells or cancer Pro have, might have progressed. Might have progressed. Right. So a lot of that, I mean, we can start with just the basics. So a lot of times it's just talking to the patients about their symptoms. And so sometimes the patient will tell me I'm short of breath, and as I kind of tease things out, they might tell me, you know what, when I'm walking also I get chest tightness or chest pressure. And then that would sway me to say, you know, maybe this isn't related to the cancer at all. This could be heart disease. The other component is the physical exam. So I can tell on physical exam with certain characteristics what fluid sounds are like around the lung and doesn't sound right uh, like around the lung. And then lastly is the imaging. So chest x-rays, CT scans. Today, most commonly CT scans, you can see one is a fluid around the lung. Is the progression of the cancer or are there other problems that might explain it? So you, you kind of integrate all of that information and then decide what's most likely, and then which pathway are you going to attack to try to improve the shortness of breath. Okay, so um, next we're going to hear from medical oncology. Um, Chiru Agarwal is a new addition um, to our medical oncology program. Um, Andrew, could you give her your mic? Because they're, they're recording it. Um, she uh, completed her training at Fox Chase, just recently joined us as a medical oncologist. Um, she also is very interesting. She has a degree in uh, Master's in Public Health and um, kind of organizational and program development, which is important to us as we uh, move forward. And finally, she kind of is interested in translational uh, medicine and translational uh, research, and that is really the key to moving forward. Um, translational scientists are the people who are interposed between the guys and, and women that do research on rats and mice and baboons and those things and the patient. And they're really uh, the people that uh, help transition uh, some of those early ideas into viable treatment strategies for patients. So they're oftentimes people that run uh, clinical trials uh, and generate a lot of uh, kind of notoriety when their clinical trials prove to, to be a real new, valuable, and effective treatment for the particular cancer you're working on. So we're happy to have her join us this morning and happy to have her join our, our program. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to see that you're, you've come out and you know are part of this conference. It's very good to have you here. So I'm going to keep this very informal. Please feel free to stop me and ask me questions if you'd like. So I'm Charu Agarwal. I'm a medical oncologist. And I've recently joined um, the Penn faculty. And I see patients with lung cancer over at the Abramson Cancer Center. So as we begin to talk about lung cancer, 
Um, I just wanted to point out a few facts. And as you may know, lung cancer is the most common cancer in men and the second most common cancer in women. And it is the leading cause of cancer-related death in both men and women. Most of the cases with lung cancer actually present at a pretty advanced stage. And when I say advanced stage, I mean where it's not just located to the chest cavity or the lungs, it's actually spread to other parts of the body to involve other organs or lymph nodes or structures outside of the chest. And the reason why that is is because usually lung cancer patients don't have a lot of symptoms. They don't really realize, as uh, Dr. Haas pointed out, that you know sometimes this is an discovered incidentally when patients, let's say, have a fall and get a, get a chest x-ray. So the reason why you're in this room is because we're going to be talking about locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer or, quote unquote, stage three non-small cell lung cancer. We are not really going to focus on the small cell lung cancer, which is another kind of lung cancer, which is, a diff which is just different in how it looks under the microscope. It's also relatively less common as compared to this more common non-small cell lung cancer. So stage three lung cancer is usually confined to the chest. It can be either in one chest or it can be in the lymph nodes in the chest or it can be in both sides of the lung, uh, but usually not anywhere outside of the lung. If a patient is diagnosed with locally advanced lung, lung cancer, our goal of treatment is cure. And it can be achieved in various ways. There can be different treatment modalities that we can use. And that's exactly the reason why there are so many of us involved in your treatment of locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer. You know, you'll be taken care of, usually patients are taken care of by a team of doctors that include a surgeon, a pulmonologist, a medical oncologist like myself, and a radiation oncologist. My role as a medical oncologist is to administer chemotherapy and to monitor side effects of chemotherapy. So medical oncologists are physicians that after medical school have finished their training in internal medicine. And after having done that, they've gone additional two or three years of training, especially centered around the art of giving chemotherapy, as well as the science of managing toxicities and so on and so forth. So why is chemotherapy so important in lung cancer? Um, so unlike surgery and radiation therapy, chemotherapy actually gets into your bloodstream uh, and gets to every part of your body. And chemotherapy these days can be in various forms. It can either be injected as an IV form or you must have heard about some pills that are also available for the treatment of lung cancer. It doesn't matter which way they're given. The purposes of chemotherapy is that it gets everywhere in your body. What are some of the tests that we do once patients are diagnosed with locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer? We always like to do some blood tests, and they include a complete blood count just to see what your blood counts are like and what possible effects that chemotherapy may have. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. As Dr. Haas pointed out, you would possibly undergo a bronchoscopy or some kind of pulmonary test to figure out which exact area of the lung is involved. There can be pulmonary function tests where we ask you to breathe through a tube to figure out how much pulmonary capacity or lung function you have. And we also have CAT scans and PET scans, as you had pointed out earlier, that help us define where exactly the cancer is located and what, it, what its distribution is. Some of the treatment options for locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer are, you know, surgery is very important. If the tumor is amenable to surgery, we would like to have it taken out by surgery. And after that, depending on what we find at the time of surgery and how many lymph nodes or how much, or what the size of the tumor is, patients may be a candidate for chemotherapy with or without radiation. <coughs> if the surgeon says, well, you know, your tumor is not really amenable to surgery, that does not mean that it's incurable. We can still perform chemotherapy along with radiation either together or in a sequential fashion to be able to afford patients curative treatment. So what are some of the chemotherapy regimens that we use and um, what do we do and how do we give them? So like I said before, any time we like to start patients on chemotherapy, we like to run a few tests, including the complete blood count. We also want to check the liver and kidney function test. 
And that helps us not only to dose our chemotherapy drugs, but also to make sure that there are no predisposing conditions that we should be aware of. Um, so chemotherapy can be given in combination with radiation, or it can be given after radiation or after surgery. If it is given in combination with radiation, we usually use slightly lower doses of chemotherapy. And usually, I don't want to say all the time, but they're usually given in a weekly fashion, although sometimes we give it once every three weeks as well. If they're given outside of you know, this concurrent setting, and when I say concurrent is when they're given both together, they can be given once every three weeks or also in a weekly manner. So what is the downside of chemotherapy? As many of you may know, you know, I just said it goes everywhere. The way chemotherapy works is that it acts by dividing, uh, acts by killing actively dividing cells. And you know, that's basically the problem because there are other dividing cells in our body. You know, our blood cells are constantly dividing. Uh, the cells in our gastrointestinal tract are all, always dividing. And so are our hair, our nails, and things like that. So when we give you chemotherapy, our aim is to kill the cancer cells, but they also kill other cells. And that may leave you predisposed to you know, low blood counts. If your white count goes down, that means that patients may be predisposed to infections. If the red cell count, or commonly called, called hemoglobin, if it goes down, it may predispose you to things like shortness of breath, tiredness, fatigue. And we usually always monitor for things like that. It may also cause nausea and vomiting. I have to say, we've been doing a pretty good job at controlling nausea and vomiting, much better than we did 10 or 15 years ago. And one of the reasons is that we've, we have a lot of new drugs that help us control these symptoms. And even before you get the chemotherapy, we always give you nausea medications, either IV or orally, to even prevent anything that may happen. Not only that, we give you medicines to keep on hand if in case you were to feel nauseous later on. We always check to make sure liver functions and kidney function tests are all right. So now, having said that chemotherapy pretty much kills all cells, is there a way to counteract that? And one of the new developments in cancer therapy is targeted therapy. And targeted therapy basically means that we are trying for the, chemotherapy or th the chemotherapeutic agent to actually target the cancer cells and not the other cells in your body. So there have been some drugs, some targeted therapy drugs, that are currently FDA approved for the treatment of stage 4 lung cancer. And you might have heard of a couple of them, one of them being the pill Tarceva and the other one being the IV medicine called Avastin. Um, and I'll talk to you briefly about both of those. So cancer cells not only actively divide, but they also have mechanisms for certain chemicals to act as growth factors. Um, you know, it's sort of like nutrition for the cancer cells. And what these targeted agents do is that they actually inhibit those signals or act to uh, or counteract those signals so that these cells don't get any um, stimuli stimulus to actually divide and grow. Tarceva, which is the pill, does exactly that. It inhibits the growth factor signaling. All cancer cells have on their sort of, if this is the cell, they have a receptor you know, or sort of an antenna on their surface which sort of receives these signals and you know, it gives them the stimulus to grow. But Tarceva basically inhibits the antenna signal and tells the cancer cell to stop dividing. So it's currently used in non-small cell lung cancer in the advanced setting. It's a, it's a pill that's taken every day. It's not traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy, but it's targeted chemotherapy. So since it works so well in advanced non-small cell lung cancer, we currently have a clinical trial at Penn that is evaluating the question whether addition of Tarceva uh, would help in patients who've undergone surgery. And we are looking especially at patients who have a certain molecular profile or a certain characteristic in their tumor that would tell us that they would likely respond more to Tarceva than other patients. So that's one of the clinical trials. It's being conducted sort of in a cancer consortium setting. Um, 
and it's open at, a, at several centers, and you know, Penn being one of them. And it's currently accruing at, at uh, a hub. The other drug that I want to talk to you about is Avastin. It's also called Bevacizumab. Avastin is just easier to say. It's currently approved for breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer in the stage four setting. And it works slightly differently. We talked about nutrition for cancer cells. Well, they all need blood supply um, to help them grow. They all need blood, blood vessels to reach them and help them stimulate and divide. What Avastin does is it breaks off or it tells the blood vessels to stop growing. And it's been quite effective in the stage four setting in all of these cancers that I talked to you about. But we don't know yet if it helps in this locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer setting. And exactly that is the question that is being uh, asked in this um, trial that is also open at HUP, where patients who have locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer actually undergo surgery, and then they get chemotherapy with or without the addition of this new drug, which is this targeted therapy called Avastin. And that is also a clinical trial that is being conducted by a cancer consortium and is currently open at HUP. Um, some of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about, um, let me just take a look. There are always um, clinical trials that we are developing, and Dr. Rangan is going to talk to you about newer radiation techniques that we have. I talked to you about the targeted therapy and the chemotherapy side of things, but there are always new things that we are developing, and we are very keen in developing um, avenues for improving the lives of patients with locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer because we think it is a curative condition and we definitely need to do better. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. What about Sorry? Crisotinib? Uh, Crisotinib? Yes. So Crisotinib is a very interesting drug. Um, you know, I talked to you about receptors on the cells uh, being present and certain molecular characteristics in patients. So crizotinib is a drug that targets another kind of molecular characteristic, if you will call it. It's called the EML4 ALK translocation. It's a very fancy word for basically saying that your chromosomes are, you know, jo jointed a little differently in these cancer cells. And these kinds of translocations are more commonly seen in patients who are never smokers, um, patients who have an adenocarcinoma kind of a non-small cell lung cancer. And this drug is currently approved for the treatment, was recently approved actually, not too long ago, FDA approved for the treatment of advanced non-small cell lung cancer. We still haven't figured out a way how to incorporate this into the locally advanced or stage three setting, but we would be very interested in looking at that in the future. I was screened for it, but uh, I think that it, my cancer was not, hadn't spread enough for it, wasn't at that point. Although, I don't know, like you said, it's still under research and they haven't come to real, any real conclusion about that. Uh, just to ask this really quick, um, what about if you're in chemo, uh, taking supplements or herbs along with chemo, if you're in chemo, how does that work? I mean, that's sure. what I do, so <laughs> it's sure. working pretty well. <laughs> so I get asked that question a lot. Um, to be honest with you, we don't exactly know a lot about herbs and herbal supplementation and how that affects cancer, simply because we don't have a lot of studies answering that or looking at that question. You know, there are no studies that divide half the patients who get the herbal supplement versus not. What I usually like to tell patients is that please let me know what herbal supplements you're taking because there are certain ones that actually interact with chemotherapy and can increase or decrease the levels of chemotherapeutic agents in your blood. But if we don't have any evidence on it, doesn't mean that it's bad or doesn't mean that it's good. So I always like to tell patients, keep me informed, and as long as you're not doing too much of it, it's probably okay just because we don't know enough about it. I mean, you probably saw in the press the, the, the information about vitamin E well, I was prostate care. This week, oh, prostate, prostate cancer. And prostate right. cancer. I, I don't think that's your problem. Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> I was covering a colleague of mine this week uh, and, and helping him cover the clinic who's 
specialized in prostate cancer. Every patient I saw asked me about new information about PSA screening and the new information about vitamin E. And I think that one of the things that we find out is that there's there's no free lunch in life. Just about Breathe. anything that you take. High doses raise your risk of prostate cancer. There's no negatives to it. And, and almost, there's almost no supplement that you can take. Same thing with lung cancer. Mega, regulated by the FDA. You never know exactly when you buy a supplement from one store and go to another store and you buy the same supplement, let's say, uh, you know, green tea or whatever it is. <laughs> whatever that active ingredient in that supplement that may be good for you, you don't know how much of it you're getting when you take uh, pills day after day. You know, it might vary significantly from one pill to another or from one batch to another because there are no real regulations. So that's you know, there are just some things to be mindful of. I'm not against supplements, but it's something to at least be aware of. It's not, it's not that it's always good. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're taking comments from the peanut gallery, I have responses to both of her questions, really, and tie in with yours. Make sure you have the hook ready to pull me off stage when you're ready to cut me off. This First, your day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm taking crizotinib. Great. I do not have the ALK gene. Mm -hmm. I have another one that will be written up in a paper soon. Um, if a person is a never smoker, in my opinion, if a person is a never smoker and is negative for the other three genes that are currently being tested, um, EGFR, uh, uh, KRAS, and uh, uh, ALK, that it may be worth, there may be a, a chance that it's worth uh, doing more tests. So my oncologist here at Penn referred me up to Boston for that further genetic testing, and I just happen to be very lucky. It, you know, the, the odds are very small that mm -hmm. I had the gene they happen to be doing research on, but I'm currently in a small trial of this drug that has like 12 people in it from the world. <laughs> so, uh, but I've had the gene, uh, but I'm not on it. Oh, you have the ALK yeah, gene? I have, I have yeah. Okay. I was uh, screened and they said yes, I was, had the gene for it, but there were other factors that didn't. Oh, there's other reasons? Okay. Like, yeah, there can be. Like, you, liver issues are a primary one, for example. Well, um, n not that that's an issue, but I can say that in my case, it's like a miracle drug. Within 36 hours, my primary symptom disappeared, which is fluid in lungs. Uh, never really had a cough until they diagnosed me. <laughs> right. uh, and they said, you have cough. I don't have cough. Yes, you do. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the, no noticeable side effects uh, from, from taking this, although most people do get side effects. So far, I have not except for a sometimes reduced heart rate. So that was on the crizotinib question. The next question is on supplements, things like that. I would recommend being careful. When I first start, got diagnosed, I did all sorts of research. I was told, look, you got a cancer, it's really tough to treat. You know, better to watch for a while and try to get your bearings and do all sorts of tests first. And in the meanwhile, I'm going crazy. What the heck can I do? And if you want a good video on that with you know, creative things, look at, uh, Chris Carr's uh, Crazy Sexy Cancer DVD. It's fun to watch. Personal story about a woman with a rare deadly cancer that will eventually kill her like after 10 years or so, but it stays quiet for 10 years or so. And so she went deep dive into raw foods, vegetarian, all this kind of stuff. But she's a wonderful personality, very encouraging, uplifting video to watch. But I, if, if you don't like strange diets, don't go near it. But on the diet question, um, one of the things that I ran across earlier, a friend of mine sent me a link to a, a, a study. It, it was misleading, as it turns out. But the study said if you take fish oils that are high in EPA, uh, which is sort of, I think, sort of like uh, an omega-3, right. right, that this will actually um, uh, make you more resistant to wasting during chemotherapy. It sounded like good news at the time. If I have to take toxic chemotherapy and I'm poisoning my body, I'd like to be able to spare my muscles from deteriorating so no to nothing, because so many patients die of the wasting as opposed to dying of the chemotherapy or the, the cancer itself. 
So this sounds like a good strategy to do. I like the idea. Of course, that study didn't deep dive into the details. It was a small study and just superficial. And did, did they have more or less muscle wasting? Less muscle wasting. Good news, right? Well, just in the last month, another study came out, this one done by more biochemist type people in mice. And they found fish oil somehow, when in the presence of platinum-based chemotherapy, somehow combines with the platinum or creates some synthetic other chemicals that inhibit the chemotherapy. <laughs> so let's go back to the first study. What did they miss? Well, the same thing that might have been protecting the muscles from wasting away may have been protecting the cancer from wasting away. <laughs> so wait a minute. Is fish oil supplements in high doses, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Right now, it's a bad thing <laughs> in my book. But if you're taking platinum. So, you don't know. You go by these studies. One study does not a fact make. You really have to read closely between the lines. Other examples of these things were, once upon a time, beta carotene, great for people. Let's go for the high doses. People do studies, guess what? People who take high doses of beta carotene who are smokers have an increased risk of lung cancer. Uh-oh. What about someone who was never a smoker but has lung cancer? Well, whatever's irritating my lungs might also put me at risk too, so don't eat tons of carrots. Who knows? I think high doses of anything is probably not good possibly, news. Possibly. Right. Possibly. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. time for the hook. All right, thanks, Greg. That was good. <laughs> but you, I mean, you had And one of the major problems, health problems in India, is infant mortality. And if you go back to the, you know, uh, the times of my, my grandparents, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, in rural India, what one of the common causes of death in childhood was cholera, diarrhea. So patients, I mean, so children would get, you know, a GI infection, and they get profuse diarrhea. And so a simple observation was made. In the, in, by many, many villagers and many village doctors, which is if you stop and restrict the amount of water that the baby gets, the diarrhea improves. The stools start to become harder and you get more normal stools. So the solution to a child with infectious diarrhea is to stop giving them water. Now that seems like a simple cause and effect solution, right? But of course, that's exactly the wrong thing to do because what's happening is this child is losing fluids at an alarmingly high rate and what you need to be doing is replenishing the fluids and because you're restricting the fluid volume, although the stool itself becomes more hard and fully formed and the diarrhea goes away, you're actually completely depriving the child of what they need the most. And the, the cure to cholera, the cure to a lot of infectious GI infections is good hydration. So cause and effect is very, very hard to prove in medicine. And what may seem logical on one hand may turn out not to be so logical. And, and it's not just about lay people and the scientists I mean, who are out there who, who may not know what they're doing. Even people who are very, very smart, who dedicate their lives to the, the, the cause of cancer, or the cause of medicine, when they put together a randomized trial, more often than not, the reason they put, when they put together a randomized trial is because they believe they have a new treatment that is better than the old. And so they take patients and half of them get the new treatment, half of them get the old. Guess what? More than half the time, the old treatment beats the new treatment. And we see this time and time again. And that's the reason why we need to do trials. That's the reason why we need to, we need to always be asking questions and we need to be our own worst critics when it comes to evaluating new information that's out there. Because because it's, you know, when, when we develop the, 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 the self-confidence or the hubris that, oh, we know better than the disease, that's when things start to go wrong very quickly. Because we don't. The disease is very humbling. And so we have to be driven by data. And the data changes. And it gets confusing. Somebody was asking a question about staging. You know, and I was reminded of, you know, everybody in this room probably at one time or other took the SAT. And I don't know whether you know, sometime in the 
late 1990s, I think, or mid-1990s, they reset the mean on the SAT. So all of a sudden, we all became 100 points dumber if we took, <laughs> if we took the SAT before they didn't. And so that's kind of you know, staging, like, wait a second, I was stage three at one point. Now all of a sudden, I've been upgraded to stage four. You know, staging is a useful construct for physicians and scientists to kind of communicate together so that they have an idea of somewhat comparing apples to apples. But it creates a lot of anxiety and stress because it's, you know, for, for patients. And I think that, especially in lung cancer, one of the things to be mindful of is that this is a disease of a vital organ. So because of that, there's so many other factors that come into play in terms of determining how well a patient does or what the right treatment is that has nothing to do with the cancer itself. That's not really true in breast cancer or prostate cancer. If you decide breast cancer, the best approach is to do a lumpectomy followed by radiation, whether you're 80 years old or you're 20 years old, a 20-year-old woman got up today to discuss her diagnosis with lung cancer, whether you're 80 or you're 20, you can tolerate a lumpectomy. How many 80-year-olds do you know who can tolerate major cancer surgery to, of the lung? You know, it's very, it's very, very dependent upon how healthy the patient is, what kind of treatment we employ. So lung cancer is a very individualized disease in which, sure, you can get average numbers about average survival, but the average, I think, in lung cancer is far less valuable than in many other cancers. And the reason is if you were to take the average age of the person in this room, Obviously, you could get a number. You could say the average age is 40. Does that mean that if somebody walks out of this room, I can predict that that person is going to be 40 years old? No. The age in this room ranges over a wide range. And so what the average really means, oftentimes I tell my patients, is it doesn't work for anybody. <laughs> you're either going to be you know, on one side of the average or the other, but you're not likely to be at the average. It's sort of like this mythical 2.5 children and a white picket fence. Nobody has 2.5 children, you know, but that's the average. So I think that's one of the issues with staging that you should always be mindful of. It's really, it's really seductive to go to the internet and say, OK, this is my stage, so what am I, how am I going to do? Well, it doesn't really mean very much, actually, because as John said, it, it comes down to you and your outcome, and, it's, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter what, what an average means. It's, it's, it's really, averages are helpful if you have a very tight distribution around a mean. It's not helpful when you have a wide range, and I think lung cancer, you have very wide ranges. So, anyways. I, I, I'm going to introduce for Mesh. Oh, I want to introduce <laughs> himself, right? And <laughs> he's done a lot of talking, but you don't really know him yet. Yeah. So, Ramesh, you've been here seven years, five years? Five years. five years. So Ramesh joined us five years ago, and he very quickly um, uh, has become, you know, like the uh, core member of the lung cancer program. Um, he came from Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and he is a, a specialized radiation therapist with a special interest um, in lung cancer. Um, and since Ramesh has come under his leadership, the radiation therapy lung cancer group has grown from like a couple part-time guys to what, seven full, six yeah, full-time guys? Like seven people. Se seven full-time yeah. lung radiotherapist, which is, um, I don't know, it has to be qualified as one of the bigger departments, one of the bigger, groups. One of the bigger groups in the country. Um, and um, in concert with that, um, he's kind of helped and overseen a lot of the design of the new radiation therapy center, which some of you uh, have visited uh, and been treated in. And that includes the Proton Center. It includes our, the new uh, linear accelerators, which I know as patients you appreciate because you can get in and out and get your treatment done very quickly. Okay. Um, and it also includes some of the um, newer imaging techniques for planning, uh, some of the new PET CT scanning and some of the protocols that he and his group have devised, um, which really allows for uh, much improved um, uh, planning of radiation therapy and also to do it in a, a much uh, quicker fashion. Uh, and so Ramesh um, has really added a lot to our group and is one of the, the core members and now is one of the senior leaders. So he's going to talk to us a little Tell bit about how, radiation therapy. Tells you how easy it is to become senior. John refers to becoming an old man. I've been here five years and I guess I'm an old man too. So you get, you get old. Average age in this room is 40, okay? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess you, get, you become an old man quickly at Penn. And that's one thing that's true. So, you know, I, I want this to be very informal. I want people to ask questions because, again, this day is about, about you. And I thought maybe it might be helpful to talk a little bit just about what it is a radiation oncologist does. Um, what I do is very similar to what Dr. Kaharchik does. You know, both 
John and I are in the business of providing local control of disease, finding where the tumor is, targeting it, and then dealing with it in a way, hopefully, that results in sterilization of the tumor. John's weapon of choice is the scalpel. It goes in, identifies the tumor, and then cuts it out. My weapon of choice is the radiation beam. And, you know, it's very, and I think part of it is, is the way our field, the radiation field, has evolved. M much of the, the field of radiation oncology has been written by technology and by technologists. And we spend a lot of time advertising technology. We spend a lot of time advertising protons and linear accelerators and brand new facilities and brand new imaging devices. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. But when patients come and ask me, do you have the latest, do you have a cyber knife at your facility? Do you have a proton machine? You know, I, I always try to tell patients, you know, would you ever pick your surgeon based upon the brand name of scalpel that they use in that hospital? Well, if you don't have Wilson scalpels, I'm not getting treated here. I only am going to get operated on by a surgeon who uses Wilson scalpels. No, you wouldn't, right? So you shouldn't care what brand name is on the machine that aims the radiation beam at you. CyberKnife is a brand name. You shouldn't care about that at all. Choosing a radiation oncologist based upon the brand name of technology that they have is like choosing a surgeon based upon the brand name of scalpel. You should go with the doctor that you're comfortable with, and that's the most important thing. And I think that that's something we're very fortunate to have in our group at Penn. Like John said, we've had a lot of new radiation oncologists join who are specializing in lung cancer. The chairman of my department also, although he's very busy with administrative responsibilities, when he finds some time, he treats lung cancer. We have a number of people with a wide variety of expertise from a number of different, who trained at and who worked at a number of different institutions who have all chosen to come to Penn and are all working at Penn now in, in, in our department. And so I, I think it's very important when you decide where you want to get your radiation treatment to really focus on the physician and not worry about stuff that you see on billboards. You know, there's a really nice billboard that used to be on I-95 which showed this picture of this robot. You've heard of the Da Vinci robot, which is this robot that performs surgery. And it has this beautiful picture of this Da Vinci robot. It's very, very fancy. And people are using it to operate on prostate. Some people use it to operate on head and neck cancers. And people ask, do you have a Da Vinci robot at your institution? Because it seems cool, right, to have a surgeon be able to manipulate a robot, and the robot does the operation. It's got a great name. And, huh? And it has a great name. It's a great name, the Da Vinci, absolutely. And the billboard was a great billboard. And it showed this Da Vinci robot, and it said, without a pen surgeon, this is nothing more than a very expensive coat hanger. <laughs> and I kind of think of the same thing when it comes to protons or it comes to cyber knife, you know? It's really the physician that drives things. It's easy, it's sexy to hear about the technology, and people always ask questions about the technology. And the technology is cool and makes for nice slides, and I'll show you some nice slides, but it's not really about the technology. It's about, it's about, it's about who's making decisions and how the decisions are being arrived at. And, and ostensibly today, we were supposed to talk about locally advanced lung cancer. And, and what locally advanced lung cancer generally means is cancer that's restricted to the chest, but not just within the lung. It may also involve other portions of the chest, including specifically the lymph nodes that sit within the center of the chest. And the job of the lymph nodes in our body is usually a good one, right? Its job is to protect us from infections taking root. And again, the body is a funny it's a very funny thing. It's, an, it's, it's, a, it's basically a community of tissues that work together to make us whole. And one of the most important jobs that the body has is to protect us from the outside environment. Well, with the lung, you have a vital organ that every second of every moment of every day is exposed to the outside environment. So you have to have a pretty darn good security system to protect the lung from infection and from invasion because every second it's exposed to what we are breathing in. And that's where the lymphatic system comes into play. And so that's great in terms of preventing us from getting a pneumonia. But in the setting of cancer, that kind of gets turned inside out. Because the way the immune system works is it figures out whether you have a hall pass or not that's a, that, that allows you 
authorization to be within the body. Well, cancer kind of has the hall pass because it originated from within us. So it's very easy for cancer, especially lung cancer, to invade into the lymphatic system. And very early on in the disease, you, you see evidence of lymph node involvement. Lung cancer is one of those cancers with a very high propensity for getting into the lymphatic system. In fact, if you look at patients at the time of diagnosis, this is the group here that we kind of call locally advanced. A huge percentage of them have evidence of lymph node involvement. Now, this may change with the results of the screening trial and we start to try to pick up these cancers earlier. But right now, the reality of lung cancer today is a large majority of patients, when they present, they have evidence of not just the cancer within the lung, but that the cancer has started to move a little bit. And so how do we go about treating this? Well, again, we talked about the fact that this is a team approach. You have to have surgery involved. You have to have a radiation oncologist involved. You have to have a medical oncologist involved because you have to have a one-two punch. You have, to have a, you have to have a strategy for dealing with the local disease that's within the chest. But you also have to have a strategy for dealing with that behavior of the cancer that allowed it to spread. And that's why Dr. Agarwal talked to you about chemotherapy. Chemotherapy helps dealing with the fact that the cancer wants to spread, right? Because chemotherapy is given systemically. It's given either peripherally through an IV or it's given in the form of a pill, but it spreads throughout the body. And it's the one weapon that we have that travels with the cancer. And by the time you have a cancer that started to travel, we're going to need to have that be part of our arsenal, part of the one-two punch to go after the disease. And then the other part of it, which, that's my job or John's job, which is to get the primary tumor and the disease that we can see, the disease that we can identify within the chest under control, either by cutting it out or by radiating it. And that, for a surgeon, their ability to cut out the tumor, and John has one big advantage over me. He gets to open you up. <laughs> so he gets to see what he's doing. I, I don't, right? I don't get to cut you open, OK? I don't get to look inside and see where, what the lung is doing, where the tumor is. I don't get to feel the tumor. You know? So I'm completely dependent upon imaging to find my target, to identify the cancer. And that's sometimes easy to do. Sometimes it can be challenging to do. So this is what we do. We try to first find the tumor, and then we start coming up with a plan to target that tumor because it's very important to get a high dose of radiation to the tumor, but it's equally important in lung cancer to minimize, in an ideal world, to prevent any radiation from going to the surrounding structures. Now, if we lived in a perfect world, I'd be able to deliver 100% of the dose that I want to the tumor here and no dose here, but unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Radiation, especially x-ray radiation, goes in one side and out the other. So that means, although I can focus in on this, the surrounding structures do get some dose. So when we talk about the side effects of radiation, the side effects are all dependent upon where I'm aiming my beam. So a patient will ask me, you know what? I had a friend who had radiation treatment. And boy, she really lost all of her hair. And you're talking about treating my lung. Am I going to lose my hair? Well, you may lose hair on your chest, but you're not going to lose hair on your head unless I'm aiming at the wrong place. So right? You may appreciate this. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's true. It's very important to know because that's a very common question that I get. Am I going to lose my hair from this radiation treatment? Radiation side effects are completely dependent upon where I'm aiming my beam. And the side effects occur based upon tissues, normal tissues, being hit by the radiation beam. And when they respond, you get side effects. So the beam isn't going there. You're not going to get side effects in that area. So when you exchange stories about, oh, my friend got radiation treatment, oh, my brother got radiation treatment, that hopefully will help demystify some of it. Because one person's side effects have nothing to do with another person's side effect, unless you happen to know exactly where that beam went in the setting of your friend or cousin or loved one. There's no way to predict. Yes. Do you have to take uh, a little more of the, uh, the tissue cells around it? Absolutely. So no matter what you do, whether you're going to operate on the cancer or whether you're going to radiate the cancer, you have to provide an additional margin around the cancer. Because lung cancer, we've learned again and again and again, needs to have a wide berth. It's not enough. Unlike breast cancer, where you can do 
a surgery such as a lumpectomy where you just remove the lump and throw it into a bucket. Lung cancer, you can't do a lumpectomy per se. You can't just treat the lump. You have to treat margin around it. Why? Well, there's some controversy. We don't know exact, we, we, there's no absolute proof as to why you need to take out the entire lobe of the lung, but we know that when we try to do more limited surgery, just removing the tumor, the cancer comes back. The theory is it's because that even when you see, what you see is not what you get when it comes to lung cancer. The theory is that when you have a tumor sitting here and you think you can take it out just by taking out that tumor, there's still some tumor cells that are floating in other parts of that lobe. There's still some tumor cells that may be floating in the lymph node. And remember, Dr. Trujin this morning said, the limit of our detection on a scan may be about a millimeter or two. Well, a millimeter, although seems very small to us, represents hundreds of thousands of actually millions of cells because you could fit a million cells into a millimeter of space. So if you have 10, 20, 30 cells that are floating around in another part of that lobe of the lung that aren't apparent on the CAT scan, you want to get it out and into a bucket. The same way when I do my radiation, I don't want to just zero in on this. I want to have some margin around it to try to address the microscopic disease that we don't see. So that's a very good question. Sometimes it's hard to actually find exactly where the cancer is. So if you look here, black is lung, gray should be tumor. So if you look at this patient, this is their heart, so that's normal. But all of this area is abnormal. So it looks like their whole right side of their chest is filled with tumor. When in fact, we take a look at the PET scan, actually, the tumor is actually sitting right here. So you could imagine, before the days of the PET scan, if I were going to target this tumor, I would have to target this whole area because I have to assume all of that is cancer. Versus with the PET scan, I now see that there's just a very small focus of tumor, right? And I can zero in on that. That's got to be much better for the patient by focusing on that rather than treating all of this normal tissue. Well, I gather cancer comes in different configurations. I'm sure it does. I hear about solid mass, and uh, what I've been told I have is ground glass. Ground glass opacity. So what, what is that? So when we're talking about solid masses versus ground glass opacities, it's just very descriptive. We're talking about the way it appears on a CAT scan. So cancers that appear a little bit hazy on a CAT scan and usually, usually is associated with a particular subtype of non-small cell lung cancer. Usually bronchoalveolar cancers tend to show up as ground glass opacities. Adenocarcinomas, early adenocarcinomas tend to look like ground glass opacities. And the reason you call them ground glass opacities is if you look at the lung tissue that well, I, don't, I don't know if I have a good slide here with lung tissue, but if you look at the lung tissue, it'll look like you, somebody's poured salt and pepper on the tissue there. And so it'll look like there's ground glass peppering that area of the lung. It doesn't look like a solid mass. And that gives us some insight into how the cancer will behave. There are no hard rules about this, though. Like John said earlier today, with a PET scan, there are no perfect rules with a PET scan. The PET scan doesn't diagnose you with cancer. It gives us... All it does is it tells us where to hunt, okay? And it tells us there's something perhaps abnormal there. There's a group of tissues that are taking up a lot of sugar, for example. And it says, okay, this is an area that, you know, is somewhat suspicious, but it's not proof. There are many reasons why patients can have a lot of uptake on a PET scan that have nothing to do with cancer. Yep. So PET scan is not perfect. If it was perfect, we'd never have to do a biopsy. We just do a PET scan and we'd say, aha, we know that you have. That's one of the issues when you when you hear in the press or an advertisement on the radio or if you're watching TV like I do sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning, come and get a life scan or whatever. That's one of the challenges, you know, when you hear about these things that sound so attractive. Again, cause and effect. So the idea of going and getting your whole body scan. Whole body scans, all, what that does is it tells people, okay, there's something abnormal here or something that looks a little bit different. It doesn't come with a label saying, this is cancer, okay? It just tells us that there's something abnormal going on there. The only way to get proof is to take tissue out and look at it under a microscope, okay? So that's, that's one of the things to kind of be aware of when you're thinking about cancer in general. Hey, so Craig has a question. Yeah. What was that? Yes. You said the tumor of that was very small, so what's that huge gray area? That that's collapsed lung. Good question. So what ended up happening was this tumor was sitting in an airway. 
It collapsed all the lung around it because you couldn't, so the lung wants to collapse naturally. And what keeps the lung open is breathing in air to keep the pressure up, to keep the lung expanded. And, you know, with, with the exception of COPD and other stuff. But yes, in general, the lung wants to collapse, right? So if you choke off the airway, kind of like a balloon behind it, it'll just collapse. And once lung collapses, it looks just like tumor on a CAT scan. So that's why you need somebody like Dr. Haas to come and core that out, or Dr. Karchik to go in and mechanically open things up. How effective is that radiation? I'm sorry, say that again? How effective is that radiation on the tumor? How, I mean, does it actually destroy it? Or, I mean, what did you say? So radiation is very interesting in that there is no life force that I'm aware of that can survive a high enough dose of radiation. We use super high doses of radiation to sterilize tissue for transplants. No bacteria, no virus can survive a high enough dose of radiation. One of the things about cancer in general, people think the problem is we don't know how to kill the cancer cell. It's not true. There are many, many, many ways of killing tissue. We have many ways to poison and to kill a cancer cell. The challenge is to just kill the cancer cell without killing anything else around it, right? So if you kill the cancer cell, but you kill everything else and you obliterate everything else, you've done the patient no good. So with radiation, same thing is true. One of the challenges when it comes to coming up with radiation treatment for lung cancer is this. It is the fact that this tumor is relatively resistant in general. If you have a non-small cell lung cancer, it's relatively resistant to radiation. By relatively resistant, what I mean is that if you compare how much radiation dose it takes to kill off this tissue versus the tissue surrounding it, it takes more radiation for me to sterilize this than it does for me to start seeing effects within the lung. So at about two weeks of radiation, to the lung, I can start getting inflammation within the lung. Patients can start to feel like they've got a bit of a cough, they feel a little short of breath, and that's because the normal lung sitting around the tumor is reacting to that radiation. But I need much more than two weeks of radiation to get rid of this tumor. So I have to do a balancing act of how much dose I want to get into the tumor versus how much dose the surrounding structures can tolerate. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the latter part of the talk, which is one option is to just keep dialing up the dose, putting in more and more dose of radiation, and keep upping the amp of, of the treatment that I'm giving in the hopes of sterilizing every last cancer cell that's sitting here. And that sounds great, but the problem is the toxicities and the side effects catch up with you. And we get to a point where we're no longer helping the patient, we're actually harming them because the side effects from the radiation are so much worse than what's going on in terms of added benefit, in terms of killing off additional cancer cells. Does the uh, where it's located, how large it is, that will Absolutely. So where it's located, how close it is, if it's very close to a critical structure that's very sensitive to radiation, that means I'm more limited in the kind of dose that I can get in safely. A lot of times Dr. Karchik and I will have discussions about this. You know what? This is in a location which is easier for Dr. Kaharchik to go in and operate and take out than for me to treat with my beam or vice versa. And that's why we are both in the business of trying to provide local control, this control of the visible tumor that we see. And, and it's very location dependent. There's some areas where it's easier for Dr. Kaharchik to operate. There's some areas where it's easier for me to radiate. And it's very much a case-by-case -case basis in terms of deciding which is the best approach to try to get rid of that tumor. That's very true. And so again, do we have fancy techniques that allow us to target the tumor? Yes, we do. We have protons, we have photons, we have very fancy technologies that allow us to shape the beam of the photon beam, the x-rays, which is the standard radiation that people use, shape it in exquisite ways so we can deliver dose around the tumor and really prevent there being additional dose to the surrounding structures, but it's still not perfect. In a perfect world, my dose would just fit right around the cancer, and you would see very little dose around the rest of the rest structures, but that's just not the reality that we live in. So we have to find a way to optimally deliver the dose to the tumor while minimizing the harm to the surrounding tissues. And one of the other challenges that I have to deal with that, let's see if I can get this to work, 
that Dr. Karacek doesn't have to deal with is my patients insist on breathing <laughs> when I treat them. No matter how much I ask, I haven't had a single patient agree to stop breathing while I treat them. And so if they're going to insist on breathing, I have to account for having my beam hit a moving target, right? And that's very challenging. And there are many different approaches for trying to address this. But one of the biggest challenges that we have as radiation oncologists is the energy and the electromagnetic pulse and everything that's required to generate this beam of radiation makes it essentially impossible to get images of the tumor while the radiation beam is on because the beam itself carries such a magnetic field around it, it disrupts any other sort of imaging capability. So I'm not able to visualize what I'm treating while the beam is on. So I have to come up with secondary approaches in terms of figuring out where this tumor is while the beam is on. So there are ways that we can do this. One is I can watch the chest and see how much the chest moves up and down. And when the chest hits a certain point in terms of its rise, I can turn my beam on. And then as soon as the chest goes away from that, I can turn it off. So that's one approach that I could use. The other approach I could use is I can, when you come in for a planning session, very carefully take a movie of this tumor, see where it goes during your breathing cycle. And then I can develop a plan such that no matter where this tumor is within the breathing cycle, it's going to fall underneath the beam. There are many, many different approaches to, to try to address this. But it's still a challenge. And it's not easy. And so, you know, these technologies help you, help address, you know, some of the obstacles that we face at trying to target the lung tumor. Again, in cancer in general, whether it's surgery or chemotherapy or radiation treatment, it's all about finding a way to deliver our toxic treatment to just the tumor and trying to protect the surrounding structures as best as possible. And we talked a little bit. What we, what we want to do is this, take a patient, who has a tumor, identify it, treat him with a combination of chemotherapy and radiation, and then see the tumor melt away. Okay, This is what we want to do. Now, we can get this, let's say, with two months of radiation, but we only consider it to be successful or a cure if 100% of those cancer cells are dead. Right? It's not good enough for 99% or 99.9 .9 or 99.99% of the cancer cells to be dead. We want to get 100% of them to be dead. So if two months can give me this kind of a response, why not treat for three months? Why not treat for four months of radiation? Why not do six months of radiation? The reason is it's a long time. Even two months is a pretty darn long time. And again, we're getting to all of you are already asking this question. Somebody looked at my slides ahead of time. But all of you are asking this question, which is what we wrestle with with every patient in the clinic which is balancing between trying to control the disease and managing the side effects of the treatment that we're delivering. The black curve is the one that everybody thinks about. As we intensify our treatment, we get better and better control of our disease. But the red curve is what we are all bounded by as clinicians, which is as we dial up our therapies, the harm to the patient goes up. And that's one of the big challenges. So, the approach that radiation oncologists have taken for years and years and years is just simply dialing up the dose. And that's yielded mm, some benefits, but they're modest. In fact, there was a big randomized trial that looked at this, taking patients with, and randomizing them. Again, we talked about randomized trials. Six weeks of radiation versus eight weeks of radiation. And radiation oncologists to a person were sure that the eight weeks of radiation would win because this is better, more treatment, right? I'm killing off more cancer cells, and heck, we're so much better today at delivering our radiation treatments than we were in the past, that if we can move past the old standard of six weeks to the new standard of eight weeks, we're going to help patients. Guess what? This is the six-week group. This is the eight-week group. This is the exact opposite of what you want to see. This is survival. Now, both of these survival curves are pretty darn good in terms of survival for lung cancer. But guess what? You'd rather be up here than here, right? But this is with six weeks of radiation. This is with eight weeks of radiation. Again, no matter how smart we think we are, we get outsmarted by the disease on a regular basis. That's why it's so important to do clinical trials. And what this tells us is simply dialing up the dose may not be an effective strategy at helping the patient with lung cancer. 
And so we have to come up with more intelligent ways of doing this. Well, it's, what if there are ways to manipulate these curves? Maybe find a way to move the red curve to the right. If we can move the red curve to the right, then for any given dose of radiation, I'm not creating as much harm to the normal tissue. So this is where protons come in. So if you look at a standard X-ray beam, okay, this is, imagine that you are this rectangular patient. And imagine that this is the tumor sitting right here, okay? If I aim my X-ray beam right at the tumor from the front of the patient, and this is the skin, so this is the front of the patient, this is the back of the patient, just thinking about it, what would you want? What you would want is you'd want the dose to be centered right here, and there to be no dose on this side and no dose on that side, right? Now, if you look at this graph, the yellow, okay, represents where the highest dose is. The blue is cooler. It's where lowest dose is. Now, look, you'd want the tumor to be red hot, right? But it isn't. Red hot is just below the skin. You'd want there to be no blue on this side of the tumor. You wouldn't want any dose on this side of the tumor. But there is dose on this side of the tumor. This is beyond the tumor. Why would you want there to be dose there? And you wouldn't want there to be any dose in front of the tumor. You'd want there to be a nice, perfect square that matches the tumor. That's what you'd want. But this is a fundamental physical property of x-rays. The dose, the highest point of dose, is just below the skin surface. It's not where the tumor is. And there's continued, the, the x-ray beam deposits dose as it goes through the patient from the front all the way to the back. So what that means is, I can't just use one beam to treat this tumor. If I do that, if you imagine the steak that's sitting, I'm a vegetarian, I can't believe I'm using this analogy, but if you imagine a steak, I've been told, if you put a steak on a barbecue, okay, you put your hand on the top of the steak, it's gonna be cooler than your hand on the bottom of the steak, which is gonna be cooler than the grill itself, right? So that's kind of the analogy here. This is, if you imagine the tumor is a steak, you know, what you want, though, is the steak to be uniformly heated. You don't really care whether the grill is heated. You really want the steak to be uniformly heated. And unfortunately, what we're having is the hottest point is up here, closer to where the beam originates, and the cooler points are out here, and I'm not getting the heat where I want it to go. So I can't just use one beam to treat this tumor, because if I do that, this would take such a beating before I get to the dose I want to get to for the tumor that it wouldn't be worth it. So what we do is use multiple beams that shape around and zero in on the tumor. That's the approach that we've used for years with x-rays. But this is a fundamental law of physics that we can't get around with x-ray beams. If you move to protons, this is better. So yeah, so I mean, this is just an example of a, a hypothetical you know, rectangle. So we could go this route. We could go this route. But no matter what, the, the shape of what you see wouldn't change. So if I used a beam coming in here, the hot spot would be here, and it would be cooler here, and it would be blue here. That doesn't change. So this isn't just a trick of where the, which beam I chose. No matter which beam I use to aim at this tumor, the hottest spot is going to be closer to the surface and it's going to cool down as it goes further and further into the patient. So instead, let's say I want to get full dose to this tumor. If I use three different beams, each responsible for delivering one-third of the dose, and they all focus in on the tumor, then these hot spots sp get spread around, right? And then the tumor becomes the point of maximum dose because all of these zero in on the tumor. So that's one approach that you use to start to get around it. But at the end of the day, you still can't get around the fact that some tissues that you don't want to have any dose deposited in is still going to get dose. In a perfect world, I only want the red hot to be on the tumor, and I don't want there to be any dose on either side of the tumor. Protons gets us half of the way there. It solves two issues. Number one, the hottest spots, I can dial it up. I can manipulate my proton beam such that the hottest spot is right at the tumor. So that's great. That's where I want the hot spot to be. Number two, with protons, there's no dose beyond the tumor at all. It stops. It stops where I want it to stop. So you don't see any of the blue on this side. We still have the issue of dose in front of the tumor. 
but it's not so bad because it's lower than the dose that's actually in the tumor. So this is one of the reasons why we're excited about protons. And this is a way to move that toxicity curve over to the right, right? Because if you imagine that red curve for this patient versus this patient, this patient has a more favorable red curve for any dose I want to give. That's why we're excited about protons. And we've done some studies to show this, and this is just an example of that. Yes. We actually have a pair of trials for patients with locally advanced disease with proton beam radiation. One for patients who are surgical candidates, one for patients who are not surgical candidates. And we've actually been getting calls and requests from all around, actually all around the world. I, had, I treated a woman from Australia very recently. So from all around the world to come and to get proton beam treatment. One of the things that's unique about the Penn proton beam facility is that we have x-rays and protons all under one roof, all right next door to one another. Most proton beam facilities kind of sit on their own because it takes a lot of space. It takes the size of a football field to generate a proton beam. So oftentimes they're in, in you know, they're miles, sometimes hundreds of miles away from the main center. And so if you want to, sometimes, believe it or not, the best approach is a combination of both protons and photons for a patient. There's some, it's not always the case that just protons are better. Sometimes it's better to mix the two, depending, again, on the location, depending on the type of beam I can use. And the luxury that we have, because everything's under one roof, I've had a patient very recently who got part of their tuber treated with protons, part of it treated with x-rays. They'd get lie down on the proton machine, get treated, then walk over to the x-ray machine, get their treatment, all done in one day, all under one roof. And this just isn't feasible at other at other locations. So that's one of the reasons why people are interested. This is where I think the real breakthroughs are going to come in the treatment of lung cancer. Not moving the red curve to the right, moving this black curve over to the left, which is to make, take advantage of the biology of the tumor and use it against it. So finding ways to manipulate the tumor to make it more sensitive to the treatment that we're delivering. So you, somebody asked about the drug crizotinib, Zalcori. Crizotinib is a perfect example of using an understanding of the biology of the tumor to target an agent that exploits that biology selectively to kill off cancer cells. And that's the way crizotinib works. And that's the way, to a certain extent, some, some of these other drugs like Tarceva uh, work. Targeted agents, that's what they do. So we are in a new era now in lung cancer of not describing and fashioning treatments for patients simply by stage, but actually fashioning treatments based upon the biology of the tumor itself. And one of the things that we've started to do is to put together a tissue bank where we type every tumor that comes in the door so that we have an idea of, okay, we may not have a solution today, but eventually we'll have a solution. And if we do happen to have a solution today, let's say the standard solution doesn't apply. As Craig mentioned, he's getting, he's, he has a non-standard indication for the use of the drug crizotinib just because we know that patients with mutation 1, 2, or 3 makes them sensitive to a particular type of treatment, it doesn't mean that if you don't have that mutation, you won't respond to the drug. And we've seen that with Tarceva. We've actually seen big trials in Tarceva where even patients, regardless of whether they have a mutation for it or not, they actually benefit from getting the drug. So we've seen this again and again in cancer. Now, crizotinib is a bit of a different story because it actually targets a specific type of translocation, but we could talk about that later. This is an interesting story. Somebody submitted a question before, um, before this meeting, and it was sent to me uh, via an email about what kind of targeted pathways do you target in radiation? Well, the way a tumor survives radiation is ultimately the way a radiation beam kills the cancer cells is by damaging the DNA. So if a tumor cell wants to survive after being hit by a radiation beam, it's pretty simple, right? What it has to do is repair the damage to the DNA. So one of the areas of interest in our group for a very long time has been to try to elucidate the repair mechanisms that a cancer cell uses to fix the DNA. If we can take out that repair mechanism and prevent the cancer cell from fixing the DNA after it gets hit by radiation, then guess what? The cancer cell is then left without an ability to protect itself, right? Makes the cancer cell more sensitive. So this has been an area of 
significant interest in our group for quite a while. And we picked out some players that are very important in the pathway of repairing damaged DNA after being hit by radiation. And it turns out that this group of molecules, particularly this little one in the center here, PI3K, is very important. Okay? But the challenge is, in a test tube, we can take this molecule out. We can knock it out. We can make cancer cells die very quickly. Just if you say the word radiation loudly enough in front of the test tube, the cancer cells will start dying <laughs> if you take this molecule out. The problem is the drugs that we can use in a test tube don't work so well when we give it to patients, right? There are always unintended consequences. Somebody asked about supplements and stuff like that. Well, we can come up with a great agent to take this out that works well in the lab. But when we give it to patients, you have unexpected and unwanted side effects. And one of the side effects of the, the inhibitors that were commonly employed to take this molecule out is that it had cardiac side effects. It caused arrhythmias. And so they're not suitable for clinical use. Well, one of the researchers in our lab had the bright idea of saying, okay, let's take this disadvantage and turn it around. You're all familiar with the drug. We've been talking a lot about being bald. I, I have a feeling that I'm going to start losing my hair soon, too. We've been we, you're all familiar with the drug Rogaine, right? Okay. What you may not know is Rogaine, trade name for Rogaine is minoxidil. It's actually a very effective blood pressure medication. The hair growth that is stimulated by Rogaine is actually a side effect of the original intent of the drug, which is to, to, to address hypertension. So hair growth is a very unwanted side effect if you're treating a 22-year-old woman with a blood pressure medication. They are not very happy if they get hair growing everywhere. But if you take it to a bald man, they love that idea, right? So one person's side effect is another person's treatment, right? And so that's how Rogaine kind of came to be. Well, one of the researchers in our lab said, are there any drugs that are out there that may be intended for something completely different but happen to take this out, take out this molecule in a cancer cell? And it turns out there is. It's a group of drugs that are used to treat HIV patients. They're very effective at killing off the virus, okay? But they happen to have a side effect. It has nothing to do with its primary property and the toxicity and its lethality towards the virus. It happens to have a side effect of knocking this molecule out. And so we already know that this drug is safe because it's been given to tens of hundreds of thousands of HIV patients. It's, H it's FDA approved. So let's bring it to the lab. So let's. This is when we talk about translational research, this is what we mean, about the interplay and the connection between what's going on in the bench, in the lab, and what's going on at the side of the bed. Bench to bedside is the phrase that we oftentimes use. And this is an example of going from the bedside to the bench. So taking something that's already out there, like every day we hear about new benefits of taking aspirin, taking something that is already out there and seeing whether it can, be, the side effect of that drug, if you will, will help us. It turns out that this was very effective at making cancer cells sensitive to radiation. And one of the first jobs that I had when I came to Penn was to start a clinical trial for lung cancer patients, having them get the standard chemotherapy and radiation, but just take this pill along with their treatment to see if, number one, was it safe? Because sometimes, again, when you mix and match things, you can get into trouble. So the first step is to do a careful phase one trial <laughs> to see when, there, when we add this pill to chemotherapy and radiation, are we getting side effects that we didn't originally expect? And what we found was we didn't. But what we found that was very gratifying is that patients had their tumors respond at a rate that was higher than what we would expect for patients with this type of lung cancer. Significantly higher, actually. But again, you always have to remember, I can make anything look great when I'm dealing with small patient numbers. And this was a small patient group. But in this small group of patients, 60% of them had complete disappearance of their tumor within three months after they finished their chemotherapy and radiation. Usually what we would expect in this group is not 60%, but more like 20% of them will have the tumor shrink down to the point that we don't detect it on a PET scan. And the other 40%, so 60% of them had complete disappearance. The other 40% had what we would call a major response, which means at least 75% of their tumor went away. And again, for that, we'd expect that number to be more like 30 to 40% in, in the standard lung cancer patients. So we'd expect about a third to half of the lung cancer patients who get treated with the combination of chemotherapy and radiation to have the disease look exactly the same when we scan them afterwards or even get bigger. And in this 
group of patients, for whatever reason, we had all of them have a significant response. So we were kind of excited by this, and so we've taken this to the next phase, which is a phase two, and we're almost done with the phase two, actually. And one of the things that we believe is that maybe this drug, as the story keeps unfolding, it isn't just simply targeting this molecule. It seems to have an effect on the blood supply to the tumor. Dr. Agarwal talked about Avastin and how it deprives the tumor cell and chokes off of the blood supply to the tumor, thereby depriving it of the nutrients that it needs. Well, we think that this drug may also manipulate the blood supply independent of its effect on this molecule. It may manipulate the blood supply to the tumor and make the tumor um, sit in a more favorable environment to getting zapped and killed off by radiation. And we're actually, we're very fortunate. We have a world-class group of radiologists who are very good at techniques of measuring blood supply to tumors. So when patients go on this trial now, they get a scan to quantify the blood flow to the tumor before they start the drug and while they're on the drug. And we're nearly finished with that. The, the message in general to all of you is that the one-size-fits-all approach to lung cancer is over. It doesn't make sense anymore. We have to individualize our treatment. You've all, you are all an example of that. I bet if no two patients in this room had exactly the same treatment, I know you didn't. No two patients in this room had a standard textbook course of treatment. I know Craig didn't. You have to be able to individualize. It's about, it's all about individualization. It's all about personalization. And, and simply going with a cookie cutter approach for lung cancer doesn't work. And that's because everybody's different. And that's it. Thank uh, you all. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's, uh, let's see, it's 10 after 12. Lunch starts at 12.15, so that's about a five-minute break for everybody. Um, if anybody has any questions, by the way, the free lunch is the best part of the day. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I come. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's the value of conferences like this, you know, and when we're seeing a patient, you remember, in an office setting, you know, there's 40 other people there, and, and sometimes it's unfortunate that we're rushed. So that's one of the values of this. The other thing I'll tell you is something that I tell all my patients is, uh, you know, I'm pretty confident in what I do, and I encourage people, if you have a question or you're not sure, get a second opinion. And I'm more than happy to provide my records to them. I'm more than happy to call them and tell them what my opinion of your case is. Um, because I'm fairly confident in my decisions and what I'm doing. And I, actually, if I'm wrong, I kind of want to know that. If somebody has a better idea, I'd, I'd like to entertain their idea. But what I do tell people is you got to make sure when you get your second opinion, you have to have it from someone that's comparable, right? So, for example, if it's a surgical opinion, you got to get it from a guy that does a lot of lung cancer surgery. If it's from a, a radiation therapist or a medical oncologist, you have to get it from uh, a physician who just is specialized in that, especially when you deal with us. You got to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Well, I'm, I'm just curious since yep. you had that lung surgery, but mm -hmm. it wasn't taken out. Mm -hmm. I had it at 10. Mm -hmm. I think I made a comment in the room that mm -hmm. I did. And he didn't take the, just the thing out. Mm -hmm. I'll call it the thing. The thing. That's Radiation therapy. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm talking about second opinions. We went, we drove to, I don't think they need that. Uh, we drove to Houston, MD Anderson. Mm -hmm. And all the doctors had been, had everything ready. They overnighted everything for us because they wanted us to yeah, get the absolutely. second opinion. Um, people in Texas were on the same page as the people in Philadelphia. And um, uh, you were wonderful sending everything for us. Oh, good. And it worked. Yeah, it's a small community, actually. We know all the guys at MD Anderson. So we all know each other. Thanks a lot, everyone.